Welcome back to the Student Hub Live Refreshers Orientation event. Well, we've certainly covered a lot today. I hope you know a lot more about the Open University. But some things you may not know about the Open University are that some of my colleagues are involved in some amazing missions. In 2020, there are two missions. There's the ESA rover ExoMars and the NASA Mars 2020 rover mission, which will be launched to study uh, two new places on the surface of Mars. And they're going to be investigating this question, could there ever have been life on Mars? Now, to answer this question, it doesn't just require these rovers. It also requires a detailed knowledge of the geography, the geology, and the chemistry. So to discuss these issues, I'm joined by Suzanne Schwesner, who's a mineralogist. I'm joined by Matt Baum, who's a planetary geologist, and Michael Macy, who's a microbiologist. It all sounds very complicated. Suzanne, can you tell us what you're all doing and why you've brought these colleagues together to tell us about this exciting missions? Well, there are the new missions. Yeah. There are also current and ongoing missions, orbiters, where the OU is part of. And for example, Matt uses the orbiter images to study the surface of Mars. And we need to do all of this to learn more about the planet before we actually land there. But you also have to understand where, um, you, where life could be and how this could uh, work. And so we, do, we are doing a lot of experiments. And here at the OU, there's the astrobiology group, which does all of this. And Michael is part of that. And he is a biologist looking at how could life survive in the conditions that I, as a mineralogist, and Matt, as a physicist and planetary uh, surface person demise and think that uh, this is how it could be and the rovers measure it and uh, add detail to it and then we do experiments and that's all done here at the OU and we have the heritage of Beagle of course and Colin Pillinger which and Beagle which Matt tells me was <laughs> just built above us yeah about, about here, in actually. this building in, the, in this room I yeah think, so. yeah and so we have a good heritage here to be involved in this exciting research and the future that is just coming now Brilliant. So you're all working in really different broad areas of the sciences. Matt, can you tell us um, what, what Mars looks like? And, and I guess there's this big question about how similar it is to, to our planet Earth. Well, it's, it is actually really similar. Mm. Um, if you take away the trees, the water, the people, you know, it, it does look a lot like the cold deserts you see on Earth. Um, I brought some models of okay. Mars. This is a Mars globe. So this, is, this one's a bit like what you would see if you were orbiting. So it's the natural colours apart from maybe some of the, uh, see it's got some of the labels, yeah, but yeah, yeah. you wouldn't see those. Um, but that isn't really how I see Mars. This is how I see Mars. So this is Mars as well. That looks much more exciting. It is. Um, we coloured it in. <laughs> so the colours actually represent the elevation, how high or low. Oh, so okay. the, so the, the cool colours, blues, are the lowest points, and then the warm colours, so the reds, and then it goes all the way up in places to, to white. These are the high bits. And so what you can see is, you know, the the north is very low, the south is very high, and we think that that's because when early in its history there was a really large you know, collision with one or more bodies you know, uh, that created a sort of big crater system here. I mean, nobody knows that for sure, but that's what we think. And also, all this stuff here, this is very young, whereas this is all very old. You can see it's covered in craters. That's yeah. because it's been exposed to you know, the, the environment around the sun for a lot longer. And it's this old stuff that we're more interested in because that's when we think, you know, life got going on Earth, you know, many billions of years ago. And those are the bits that we're interested to explore on Mars because we want to know about life on Mars. So, so you're looking at the elevation and you also look at the surface, don't you? we have got a picture, I think, to show people about right. what the surface looks like. OK. Just digging that out for you now. OK, so... Uh, Suzanne will probably recognise this as well because this is, uh, <laughs> this is from the Mars Science Holiday Laboratory. <laughs> yeah, she took this one. No, 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 no. no. So uh, what you can see here on, on, in the middle is uh, the part of the rover and then in the background you see some sort of light, you know, sort of, uh, sorry, in the, on the left you can see some light coloured areas. Those are, those are rocks, bedrocks, so that's exposed material that tells us about what Mars was like many, many millions of years ago. And then the darker brown stuff is sort of more recent. It's be, perhaps been blown there by the wind. And so, you know, bits of it are like sand dunes or sand ripples. And you might want to avoid driving the rover into those bits in case it gets bogged down. It looks like Tenerife. It does, actually. Mm. And Tenerife is actually used as a Mars analogue. So people go there to do trials with rovers and things. And in fact, Suzanne was just in Chile. Yes, uh, yes. You know, uh, and it's a very Mars-like area in Chile. 
and I was back in the UK, so I was running the control room while Suzanne was with the rover on Mars. Yes, so. uh, we did some training for the um, ExoMars rover that is coming up in 2020 because it's not only about the technology that goes there, it's also about the people and that they actually work as a team and that's what we trained. Matt had a team that uh, did the geology and uh, so you can imagine I set the task and they tried to solve the question <laughs> and they did very well. <laughs> so we will say that the people in the field with the rover, they, they are the people who make the game and the people yeah. in the trial back home, we played the game. We call them, we call them the games masters. So. But you can see why, if you're sending, I imagine, a phenomenally expensive and very precious piece of kit into outer space at a considerable expense, you need to know where not to drive oh, yeah. it. So this is really important, vital information. Um, but, but why then are you looking for signs of life on Mars and why are you going to all this effort of, of getting these things up there? Well, first of all, it's one of the big questions. Are we alone? But why Mars? Well, Mars is very close. We can get there. We understand a lot. There are other celestial bodies, the icy moons, but they are far out. We don't understand that much. So with Mars being as Earth-like as Matt described it, we could go there. We can understand it. And we understand a lot uh, because I have brought some rocks here. And this is an Earth rock, of course, but it's green and it's black. It's a basalt with some olivine. And these are the basic ingredients that we know from the rovers that are already there and also from the orbits. These things are there and we know what happens on Earth here. And of course, there are differences. For example, Mars doesn't have that much oxygen. And that's why we need the biologists, because I can't tell, can anything live without oxygen? I certainly can't. But is there anything that can? And I mean, Michael can answer those questions. Good, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, us as humans, we're what's known as aerobic organisms. So we need oxygen to generate energy and live. However, there are thousands of different species of bacteria and general microbes that can live without oxygen. They use different molecules for their generation of energy. And for some of them, oxygen is actually poisonous. So it's the complete opposite. So this presents a slight challenge when it comes to growing them in the lab. We can't use the traditional way of just throwing them into media because they'll die. Instead, we have to use a dye called resazurin to help us work out when the media is ready for them. So what's the media? Um, so media is essentially a collection of different compounds that you combine with water um, to supply the microbes that you're hoping to grow. Um, so they'll grow uh, nice and strong for the different experiments that we then subject them to. Wow, OK. So this is a general media here that's yeah. been combined with the dye resazurin. And if you can see here, it's blue or purple in color. So okay. resazurin is blue in the presence of oxygen. OK. And then as the concentration of oxygen decreases, it then starts to go this pink color. It's a lot fainter, but I think against the background, you can tell that's yeah. pink. So that's nearly ready. And then as we continue, it goes clear. Eventually, this one's much less exciting to look at. So this media, although it just looks like a clear solution, is completely without oxygen. And for the different microbes that can't grow in the presence of oxygen, this is the only condition that it would grow under. Wow, okay. So does that mean then that if they're living then without oxygen, they're still alive? And what is life categorised as? So life is one of those things that's quite hard to pin down a precise definition. So the, the current working definition that biologists use is that something is able to grow and replicate on its own. And that's right. the reason that viruses are currently in that outside circle, because they, they need a cell in order to grow and replicate. Um, but yeah, as long as something is growing, then it's considered living. Okay. So this geochemistry sounds quite complicated. Uh, you've explained it really well. Suzanne, can you tell us more? Well, I've got this rock, but I've <laughs> also got another rock. And if... Um, oh, that looks better. That's very <laughs> shiny. Well, yeah, I'm hiding the shiny part. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. about the wet part. <laughs> I've the game away. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can show the shiny part, but the, what is really important is that red part because this is green and it has iron in its redox state 2+. And this is 
is red and it is iron in its redox state 3 plus and that's something that Michael's microbes can use and uh, to, to gain energy in the absence of oxygen. And so it is very important that Matt tells us how the surface looks like so I can find out what, what type of rocks could be there and the chemistry and then we hand over to the biologists to say can anything grow in there or is there something that would prevent that and that's basically called astrobiology. Okay, well, it all sounds very simple. Let me just check in with everyone at home, HJ and Simon. Well, we're having a fantastic time in the chat. We are thinking that uh, Mars might be the next hot destination for our holidays. <laughs> yes, we don't yeah. know. Maybe a little tricky to get there. We're not too sure. Um, Although Robert said, <laughs> not great for parties, no atmosphere. Oh, oh, that's that's sticking oh, with the birthday oh, theme, though. Sticking that's with that's the that's birthday that's theme. That's <laughs> Um, a slightly more sensible um, comment from Haley, who wanted, who noted, said she was super excited mm. when she discovered um, the, when they discovered water vapor on an exoplanet, which I think is quite recent, isn't it? Um, and that obviously very exciting could be life there. Mm. But, uh, yeah. So that was that was sensible. And uh, Srush just says, uh, uh, just want to say hello, and I'm really interested in what's going on in the video. And um, Beverly's finding this interesting because she just loves stargazing and thinking about what's up there. And um, Haley's sure that in Suzanne's photo, she's uh, seen some potatoes growing with Matt Damon just... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and there we were saying Haley was all sensible. Yeah, <laughs> Matt, Matt Damon has figured a little bit in the chat. <laughs> Um, so he should. Yeah, yeah, I think we'd all go to Mars if... Uh... <laughs> Bring him home, I say. <laughs> OK, so we've shown sort of some of the things that are going on, but how do we physically and practically investigate? We've talked about some of these rovers. Yes, so there are some of these robots. I mean, on the table, that's Curiosity. <laughs> that's the robot I'm currently involved with. She is on Mars. This is a model. Though. This is a model, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Yours is much, much bigger uh, and yes. more sophisticated. C Curiosity is actually more than two meters tall. So that... Um, a camera that is on the very top is at the height of about two meters. Okay. So if if we would uh, meet her, she would be higher than we are and a pretty bulky machine. And so uh, with a rover as versatile as that, we can explore and we have the eyes to look. In other words, we have cameras, but we also have chemistry instruments, which can investigate, for example, by shooting a laser at one of these rocks and then tell me the chemistry of what is in there. And that chemistry allows me to de uh, deduce what minerals are in there and even processes. Because I have the pictures and I have the chemistry, I can tell this was the original rock and it became something else, mainly through water-rock interaction. And here we have it again. Simon mentioned water and water around an exoplanet and how exciting that is for potential that there, li that there is life. Matt mentioned water. Water is the theme because it's the universal solvent in which all these reactions can happen. And when these reactions happen, then you know that you have a potential for the redox, for, for all these things that bacteria need. But how do we know that in specific conditions, I mean, we've investigated the rocks on Mars, we might have meteorites, how do we know that actually there is something that could grow in there? And then it comes to the biologists again. And I, and, uh, I think experiments like this one where we build models of the rocks, like I find terrestrial minerals that I can source on Earth and combine them in new ways that they wouldn't normally be combined on Earth to make a rock that looks really similar to what we have found on Mars. And then I take that rock and give it to Michael. And maybe he can just tell us what he does because I'm not a biologist. <laughs> so going to these two different glass vials. So as Susanna was saying, we know a lot about the mineralogy and the chemistry of the surface of Mars. And what this is at the bottom, you can see this rocky substance, is a collection of minerals that was developed by a member of our research group here, Dr. Nisha Ramkasun, that is chemically very similar, within 95% similar to the chemistry of the actual surface of a specific point of Mars. So that's and the microbes. If we shake that, we can see that it's so this is just the rocks with the water, with no microbes added. Okay. But what's really exciting about this is this gives us a proxy for the chemistry of Mars. And we can see, OK, one 
can anything grow on this, as Susanna was saying. So this one has been inoculated with microbes, so microbes were added to the spiral, and if we shake this, we can see that it's completely pitch black. Wow. And that is because of the active growing of the microbes inside. Um, there's a specific reason we're keeping all of these sealed, but this one the most, because the microbes that are growing in here on this Martian chemistry produce the same gas, hydrogen sulfide, that you get when eggs go rotten. Yeah. So that, that sulfurous, hell-like smell um, is made by these. And what's much more exciting is not only does that tell us, okay, on this specific version of Mars's chemistry, something can grow, but we can then use that to go, okay, when we get to Mars, what can we maybe look for to indicate signs of life? We could maybe look for the gases, we can maybe look for the changes that are occurring to the fluid chemistry if we find water, and we can maybe look at the changes that are happening to the rocks themselves because the microbes attach to them and they start to dissolve the rocks. Brilliant. So we've talked about some of the ways that we can investigate whether there's life on Mars on the surface and using these rovers and the chemistry within them we can do certain things. But we've also got orbiters and ways of sort of looking around the planet. Yeah, well we've had uh, things in orbit around Mars for oh, ages. 50 <laughs> years. Yeah, yeah. Right, so right. a lot, a lot, well, yeah, not quite 50 years, getting on that way. So yeah, it's, uh, it's and they take pictures of the surface um, because we have an understanding of the geology of our own planet. Uh, you know, we can use analogs that we see in places to say, well, that looks like a, a river system or that looks like a volcano. And then over the years and the decades, we developed more sensitive ways using different spectrometers, for example, to look at the mineralogy. And this is how we discover the different minerals on, on Mars. We say, wow, this place here has got a load of, for example, hematite. Why is that? So we send the rover there and the rover goes, and it finds all sorts of exciting information. And so in a, just next year, we're going to be launching the, the European Space Agency ExoMars rover. And that's a really special rover because that has the key goal is to look for signs of ancient life. You know, it's not looking for habitability. It's actually looking for signs of ancient life. Biomarkers, I think, is the technical term. Mm. Um, so the way we chose the landing site was basically to look for surface what we call morphologies, shapes of the surface that remind us of water. So in this case, it's what we call a fan, a bit like a delta, and it's at the end of a channel. So channel carved by water, load of sediment at the end, but also it's got different types of minerals. In this case, phyllosilicates, which we think can only have been formed by the interaction between liquid water and uh, I think it's basaltic starting members. And so, you know, so we've got this, these two bits of information hints to this area being the right place to look for um, you know, ancient life and, and biomarkers. And so ExoMars is going to go there, uh, launching next year and hopefully landing the year after. So, Yep. Will be exciting. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned some of the craters here, and you've been talking about some of your rocks, Suzanne, as well. How do meteorites and things that have happened tell us about life on Mars? Well, the meteorites themselves have sparked all of this with the now infamous Ellen Hills 8401. However, I have to stress there was nothing in there that <laughs> is a credible biomarker. It has started the field of astrobiology. We yeah. wouldn't have this conversation today if uh, people hadn't looked into this meteorite so closely and intensely. However, the meteorites are our best source for the chemistry because they are here. They can tell us really the chemistry in, in, in minutia detail that we only can do with Earth-based instruments because yeah. they are much bigger and you can do much more detailed investigation. Unfortunately, we do not know where from this globe they come from. So it's a bit like you send someone in the basement of the uh, Natural History Museum and say, bring me 10 rocks randomly and then try to find out where they are from. It's impossible. So we don't know where they are from, except that they are from Mars, but we can investigate them with very great detail and find out such things like isotopes and details that rovers can't do just yet. Okay, no, that's brilliant. Now, how, how does all this sort of matter to our U students? Because I can see how it's a great gig for all you guys. <laughs> um, but I must always return to the question of, of how this sort of impacts on our teaching and our students' learning. Well, we've got a lot of courses that actually do that. First of all, let me start at master level. We have the uh, Master in Space Science, where we have full nine weeks dedicated 
to Mars and uh, actually a Mars mission simulation that runs uh, in a shed not far from here um, where we have a real rover and a real Martian simulated landscape where the students can then train just like Matt yeah. did when we were in Chile and it, you are part of that as well. Yeah, it is exactly the same, exactly the same principles and I would say that the, the interface that Suzanne and others designed is probably as advanced as the one we've used on our field trials. <laughs> no, I mean, it really is. I mean, it, the master students doing this are really lucky to have you know, such dedicated academics building these things and support team as well. And it's, the Open and STEM Lab. We yep, must exactly. not forget they the are, Open STEM Lab. The ones, yes. Without them, not a single piece of code would be written. <laughs> and it's brilliant, and they yeah. love it. Yeah. You know, we've been doing it, for, you've done it for three years, I've done it for two years, yeah. is that right? And yeah. it's, been, it's been amazing. And Very of course, crazy. we have it on undergraduate level as well. Uh, there is the S283 course, which has a big part of Mars and astrobiology, and is there life anywhere in the universe? And we are currently re rewriting SXPS 288, where we have a gas cell experiment that looks at atmospheres, and maybe there's some Mars in there as well. <laughs> <Shh>. <laughs> And are there any of the ways in which um, some of the stuff Michael's been showing us here um, that, that sort of link into how we can look for life on Mars? Any experiments and, uh, you know, missions that can help us sort of use some of these things? So the ExoMars rover, it has a Raman? Yes. yes. It has yep. the Raman. I should definitely know that. <laughs> so it has the Raman on. And so they, it's, it's going up and it's, it's tooled up with all of these devices in order to screen mm. um, for changes in chemistry or unusual mineralogies. Um, and these experiments help us to identify what maybe we could be looking for. So the enhanced formation of some specific class of minerals or changes in the mineralogy of the rocks that, as far as we know, only incurs in the presence of life or mm -hmm. is enhanced mm -hmm. in the presence of life. So what we're really looking for is an unambiguous biomarker. Um, the problem is quite a lot of them are a bit ambiguous. Yeah. And it, it can happen Without life, it can happen faster with life, but of course, we don't know at what point those minerals were formed, so it's hard to judge. So what we're really screening for with these experiments is something that when we find it, we go, okay, this is, this is a good biomarker, and this is gonna help us keep looking at this specific site where we think something might be of interest here. So do you ever think the biology thing was a bit hard and maybe you should have... Uh... <laughs> I won't get you to answer that. <laughs> well, we need them. We can't do without them. Don't discourage them. No, because no. Take, take the methane, which is yeah. the gas yeah. that makes so much um, uh, stories these days. As a geologist, I can make methane easily. I take that green mineral, the olivine again, <laughs> uh, some laughing. hot water, a little bit of carbon dioxide, which is most of the Martian atmosphere, and there you go, I make methane. Mm. But of course, methanogenic bacteria make methane too. So b beyond seeing methane, we need the experiments to figure out what else. And I can't do this as a geologist. We need biology for that one. <laughs> Matt, um, I was reading about the um, uh, ESA ExoMars Rosalind Franklin rover. Yep. So what, what's that? What's the goal so, behind that? I mean, it, that is the rover that looks for life. Yeah. And the amazing thing about it is it has a drill. And we've had rovers with you know, drills, like MSL has a, a small drill. Yeah. Yeah. But Rosalind Franklin will be able to drill two meters beneath the surface. Um, the reason we want to do that is because there's uh, you know, the, the radiation dose that you get at the surface of Mars might destroy some of the biomarkers. So we think if we, if we can get down to two meters roughly, um, we'll find pristine material that hasn't been affected by the Martian environment you know, for millions of years. And so we'll have the best possible chance of sampling uh, material that then we can put into our laboratory on board the rover. And then our astrobiological colleagues will be able to tell us whether there are biomarkers or not. The whole rover is set up for this, so it's going to understand the geology first, and be, once you've understood the geology, it will then be able to target the best place to drill. When it drills up the sample, we'll know the mineralogy, we'll know the um, composition, and we'll also be able to detect biomarkers if they are there. And how long will probably. that take to drill? <laughs> oh, well, that's, a, that's a good idea. Several days, I think. Wow. So um, we haven't seen... Um, an end-to-end -end test in the field trials of yeah. a deep drill, only down to about 50 centimeters. Yeah. But uh, 
Yes, that, yeah. that, it's, it's challenging. It's a risky yeah. thing yeah. to do. It's but got a spare drill in case it gets <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It ruins it, the first one. Drilling also is a big problem because, uh, of course, curiosity drills and curiosity drills is six centimeters steep. It's basically just to sample the rock and grind yeah. them fine enough for yeah. the instruments that are in the rover belly. Yeah. Um, but still, you need to make sure your rover is on stable footing. Yeah. Just imagine you drill, you're standing on a ladder, you drill into the wall, you want to make sure that ladder is firmly grounded. And the same is for a rover. So you need to make sure you are on firm footing and then you need to drill and you need to drill very carefully. Curiosity, in the beginning, always did a little pre-drill hole that's only half a centimeter deep. Pilot hole. Pilot holes. And then did the real <laughs> hole. Now that we've gained more confidence, we do the real thing immediately. But drilling that deep also poses the challenge from a geology point of view that you drill and you don't know, you don't see what's there. Yeah. So you need to monitor your drill speed and the, the torque and everything to be sure and safe because you can't just go there and try to repair it. But the advantage of ExoMars is that it's not got a drill on the end of an arm. Mm. So the drill is attached to the rover yeah. body and it, it swings like this. But when it swings down, it's basically, you know, In like your eye position. standing like this and drilling like this. So it's, it's a good stable position. Yeah. But uh, yeah, then obviously it's less, less, less flexibility in where you can put the drill. Yeah. So there's always a trade-off in these, in these types of missions. So. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, Matt, Suzanne and, and Michael, thank you so much. It's been a fascinating conversation. <laughs> I wish we had time for more. We'll have to get you back and, and talk about things. Yes, but it's so interesting. We've been talking about sort of inter and multidisciplinary study, and it's so interesting to see how colleagues come together with different perspectives and different questions, and that you all get along pretty well, I think, oh, so <laughs> on camera. So, uh, so that's been really interesting. And also amazing to sort of see some of the work that, that, that you can do, I guess, with a qualification and at the Open University. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Um, HJ and Simon, this is the end of our show. Indeed. How are you? Oh, How's everyone at home? <laughs> no, we've, had, we've had another sensible question from Hayley to follow up with her Matt Damon ones. She was wondering about using a heat scan like they do for oceanography. I don't know if that's a possibility for looking for life. Um, and she also said that she would love to be here. Do you know what the OU strap sign is? You, you, the, the biggest thing you'll learn at the OU is what you're capable of. And, and four or five years ago, I was watching this and watching <laughs> HJ, and I didn't realise that I was capable of doing exactly what HJ does, but just badly. <laughs> um, <laughs> So oh, that's you fantastic. Know. You've so, done a wonderful job. Well, yeah. Hayley, if you want to come along, and anyone else for that matter, and um, we always welcome students um, at the Student Hub Live, obviously. Um, mm. So drop us an email, studenthub at open.ac.uk, and we'll be in touch very soon. Um, Thank you for sitting here all day, HJ. I know other people have been sitting here all day as well, I but you've been phenomenal. Been, it has been fantastic chatting to everyone, and there have been people ch sitting and chatting to us all day, which has been absolutely fantastic. And loads of people have joined the session. A lot of people are nervous, but now excited to start and feeling a lot more prepared, which is fantastic. And if there is anything we missed out and you want to contact us, do email us, studenthub at open.ac.uk. And we're looking forward to seeing you at our events tomorrow as well. But... Um, what we were thinking as well, that we have got a special day today and we have got a little something for Karen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, a special candle. Oh, that's oh. it. <laughs> so from everyone in the chat and student hub, happy birthday, Karen. Oh, <laughs> oh thank you. Make sure you blow us out. Oh, yeah, that's going to be a problem, isn't it? I might use one. Of... <laughs> yeah. Can I blow it out? <laughs> I'm all out of right. <laughs> oh! oh. Hey. Yay. Yay, it stopped! Oh, 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 thank you. They're oh. whooping. They're whooping in the chat room. It's closing up. Oh, the end. Oh. Oh, what a wonderful day I've had. It's been absolutely fabulous. Thank you for coming along. Thank you, everyone, for sharing it with me. And um, I hope you feel better about your studies. We've really enjoyed the programme today. We've got more coming up tomorrow. Um, so if you've enjoyed it tonight and you've just logged in, please feel free to join us in the chat. And we've got loads of workshops um, for the forthcoming 
upcoming academic year as well. They're in Adobe Connect. All sorts of things from time management to understanding the question um, and critical thinking and, and other hot popular topics. So I hope you can join us for those as well. Thank you so much for being fabulous, for sharing all your tips and advice, for getting involved with all the sessions that we've had today. It's been really, really good fun. And if you've missed stuff, you can watch it on Catch Up on our YouTube channel. We've also got a little subscription uh, email so you can find out about events. So give us your email address and we'll keep in touch with you that way. Um, and as we said, anything that we haven't covered, please do email us. Well, I hope you've had a good day. You can go home now for the evening and eat lots of cake and drink lots of wine and do lots of other things that we've been talking about all day. Thank you for watching and I hope you join us again at the Student Hub Live really soon. Bye for now.